Hey friends, welcome to the session. Let's hope that this thing helps me today. Looks like it's not wanted to do. If it everything goes south, I promise you that I know every single slide from the top of my head. So my name is Guilherme Ferreira. If you don't speak a Latin language, I get it. Guilherme is really hard to say. So let's agree one thing. Let's simplify that part and feel free to call me Guy. I'm Portuguese. And why that is really important? Because I don't know if you are aware, but in Portugal, we have more than 1,000 dishes using codfish, 1,000 recipes. And where do we get all that codfish? We get it from Norway, OK? About 75% of the cod that is fished here in Norway uh, goes to Portugal. It's a, um, a bout of a gross value in only in 2021 of 1.84 billion Norwegian crowns. 1.84 billion, with a B. And you may be thinking, why that is important at all? That is important because today you have to take a decision. You have to decide if you want to negatively impact your economy or if you want to leave a grid card on the way out. Okay? <laughs> Just that. Okay, so the title of the session, as you have seen for sure, and this thing doesn't want to collaborate with me. Oh no, this slide was on purpose on black. Ignore it. Uh, as I told you, I know every single slide. <laughs> and uh, uh, the purpose of this session is all about um, reconciling two different things that are widely used in our industry, but I find out that often we come up with good ideas, good practices, good patterns, good everything, when we, but when we try to combine them, usually we don't do a great job. Usually we don't look into the principles and things tend to fail. So if you have ever worked on multiple companies, if you have ever worked on multiple projects with multiple teams, you have faced questions like this. What the hell is a unit test here, right? There's so many definitions for that. Or for example, when you don't know, you are building your feature, but you don't know where to place that, that test. If it's a unit test, it's an integration test, it's a whatever test. Or for example, when you are reviewing code on that team and you notice that there's their uh, domain project, a domain layer, but no one cares about it. All the love goes into application services, right? So if I've faced some of those questions, I can promise you, and I'm promising, that by the end of the session, you will have a framework to address those kind of problems. Not only that, but also a framework to simplify your life as a developer, but for your team. And we will be doing that by enabling you to take decisions after. You, need, you can delay decisions. We'll be doing that by giving you a way to know what tests to write, where to write them, and when to write them. By the end, you will be writing less tests. And let me tell you one thing, less tests is good, okay? More tests doesn't mean that is a good thing. So I can promise you that I will teach you how to use CSS, okay? I'm not that kind of person, but that you can learn in another session for sure. So I would like to, to take you on a journey with me, and that journey is really important. Yeah, now every time there's a black screen, everyone thinks that this goes out, right? But it's on purpose. So every time that um, we want to, to go on the journey, so it, I take you with me to realize what problems are we trying to address. And that journey is basically my personal journey as a software developer. In 2006, I was fresh out of college, and I went to my first job as developer, and I was working with VB.net and ASP.NET Forms. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> worst of all, this can go worse, uh, trust me. Then I moved to work with one thing that is LogScript. Anyone have ever heard about LogScript? One person, two person, okay, right? It's even worse than COBOL, let me tell you. Otherwise, I would be rich nowadays. So I was working with those technologies, and spaghetti code was my thing. Code behind was the only way to work. When I was feeling fancy, I would extract some code to a comments folder. Not bad, but I had the feeling that there should be a better way of doing things. But I had no one to teach me on my team. No one was working with the same technologies as I. So one year after, in 2007, 
I decided to go to the university. So I would work from nine to five, and by the end of the day, I would go to the university. And there, I started to be introduced to some things. But university in Portugal for IT has an interesting thing. Usually they will teach you what was used 20 years ago. So they start by teaching me to, to work with um, three-layered architecture, multi-layered architecture. Uh, no one told me about entity control boundary. The good thing is that those kind of things in our industry usually live for a long time. And with the three-layered architecture, I was finally being able to move out all that mess from the on-click event of my buttons into different buckets, right? Presentation, domain, that application layer. So instead of spaghetti, let's go to the, the famous lasagna. Anyone here has ever cooked a lasagna? Anyone has ever went to, came up to the last layer of the lasagna and noticed that you forgot an ingredient on the layer on the bottom? I do. And usually there's no way of getting back to that, right? Or it's too messy to get there again. So, so the same happens in software. What was happening is that, okay, I have a project. First decision, which database are we using? The same of last time. It worked. SQL Server, let's say. Now let's define the database schema. N then we move on to how to write uh, to that database schema using our data application layer. Then we'll move on and we finally reach our domain logic. And as you know, we may have amazing product people on our teams, but most of the requirements usually appear when you are writing your logic, right? So on those moments, you need to go back to the database, redefine everything that you have learned, and you already lost the flow of implementing domain logic layer. That was happening to me a lot. And that didn't make sense because at the time in the university, they were teaching me Group. Anyone have ever heard about group? Yeah, it's basically how to do waterfall. <laughs> uh, proper for one age in 2008, let's say, where uh, almost 10 years before, there was extreme programming that was all about uh, rapid feedback. Or for example, the Agile Manifesto, when Kent Beck get together with Martin Fowler and many others. And they start advocating for this idea of going really fast. And don't make me talk about TDD. TDD was one of those things that made a lot of sense in the paper, but when I was using with the tools that I had, I couldn't manage to do it. I was feeling dumb, okay? The problem was mine, not, not it couldn't be the problem for, from Kent Beck. So after a, a few time, a friend told me about the book that um, you may have heard about this thing. Usually 20% of a conference is about TDD. And I'm not talking about value objects. <laughs> I'm talking about the idea of starting always by the domain, of the idea that the domain is the most important part that you need to discover. And that made a lot of, a lot of sense. But how to do that with the lasagna? So I had the luck to discover one thing that was not that famous by Alistair Cockburn, the hexagonal architecture, also known as ports and adapters. And this is interesting because Alistair was trying to fix the same problems that I was having. He was, uh, some years before 2005, he was working on a company. There was a team that was building a relational mapper. At the time, we didn't have NuGet packages to install those kind of things. And that team went back to the other teams that were using that technology and told them, you need to go home for two weeks. We need to redesign everything. So Alistair asked, can't you give us a kind of a loopback mechanism that we can mock data or something like that and we keep working? And at the time, that was completely crazy talk, okay? Everyone, no one understand what this means. So he tries to formalize this into a, a proper architecture or a pattern, and he came up with this idea that I really like. So what, uh, what Alistair came up is the, with the realization that all software has an internal and an external side. On the internal, it goes everything that is important about that software, your core application, your logic, everything that is special. But there's no code that can live without either being used by someone or having impact in the external world. So you need to have a way to bridge those two. So 
in the boundaries, what Alistair proposes is that you have a kind of a contract, a port, okay? It, it, name is, it names it a port. A port is basically a contract. And on that port, you will plug in some adapters. Those adapters can be driving the behavior of your application, or they can be driven by your application. What does that mean? That means that one of them may be an API, for example, driving, and the other may be a database, for example. The cool thing about this is that if you think, is the way that the real world works. If you go to the UK and you bring your laptop or your phone, you can charge it there. You just change your, your power adapter, right? So it's exactly the same principle. So I tried to apply this thing, but as always, what I tried to do was basically creating more projects on Visual Studio, basically that. And it didn't succeed. It was prettier then. Okay, I finally had raviolis. One of the advantages of the ravioli versus uh, lasagna is that the meat or the filling is protected from the outside. The outside can be really messy. It can be a different sauce. It can be a lot of things. But let me confess one thing. I'm team lasagna in the real world. Only in software I prefer um, raviolis. But even then, I was not having success. So when you don't have success and you see a new shiny thing, you will go for it. So I went to Onion Architecture. I can remember that somewhere in 2012, every single example built in the Microsoft space was using Onion Architecture. The difference from Onion Architecture to ports and adapters, to me, it's basically that it is more prescriptive. It will tell you that you need application services, you need uh, a domain, you need repositories, and you know how developers love repositories, right? Repositories and units of work. That is two favorite things, usually. Obviously, it didn't work out for me because I was not changing anything. I was just changing the shape of my software. And one interesting thing that was happening at the time is that testing for us was really hard. Having a pipeline was not going to GitHub or Azure or whatever and waiting five minutes after clicking a button. Having a pipeline was science fiction, okay? You, you would get your code into a given place and once a day during the night, that thing would run a set of tests. What type of tests were that? Usually a team had eight, 10 developers and one person, a QA, that would go through every single screen, endpoint, whatever, and with a mouse and with a keyboard, would do the same thing every single day. So management obviously think, if this kind of people usually write and specify exactly what they do, because they are really good on that thing, why I don't ask developers to automate that part? So the nightmare of Selenium starts, and what we were seeing is that every single night, changes will, will go to that pipeline, and it will run, and on the next day, happily we will see that it didn't run, everything failed and no one knew why, it was a nightmare. So, Mike Korn published a book in um, 2009, and there's a chapter there where he tries to address this problem with the famous testing pyramid. So, he was noticing that this pattern that I was seeing on my companies was happening everywhere. So, he proposes that tests should try to come down in this pyramid, so you should have different sets of tests. The idea of the pyramid is pretty simple. You have three layers, you try to bring tests down to make them more faster, more reliable. You may lose a bit of scope, okay? One test will not touch so many things, but you will gain <coughs> performance and reliability and feed the feedback cycle will be better. But obviously, usually in software you have two types of problems, right? Everyone knows. One of them is caching, the other one is, anyone? Naming. naming. And this one has the problem of naming. We already know the problem with the name unit, but let's talk about service and UI. If you are using Onion architecture at the time, most likely you will think that service means application service, for example. If your application was a message handler, many people believe that you shouldn't have UI tests. Those kinds of misconceptions were common. So if you look online for a solution for that, you look for other versions more expressive of this pyramid, you will find things like this. 
we, we like to create abstractions, right, as developers. So we create even more layers. So now I have analysis paralysis when I look into this and I don't know where to, to put my tests. I came to the conclusion that maybe we don't understand alien technology. Maybe that's the problem. That's the reason why this thing didn't work. But okay, we keep working. I had finally an architecture like Onion where it was easy to write tests. Uh, so we tried to do our best, let's say. In 2012, Robert C. Martin publishes a blog post that some years after came up into a book and it talks about the clean architecture. And that thing was amazing. So many news here. I'm just kidding. There's nothing new here, okay? There's one single idea here that uh, you can't find in other places. Clean architecture is all about hexagonal architecture, um, onion architecture, ECB, entity control boundary, feature uh, folders, those kind of things. It's all here, but with different names. And besides that, there's a major flaw on this diagram. I will tell you about that in a minute. But everything that you stick with clean prefix will be a success. You know that if you want to be the best on your team, you just need to talk about clean code every single time that you have the chance. Okay? The clean prefix really works, is, is, uh, is marketing. But, for example, I, I'm waiting until today for a clean, regular expressions. I would love to have that. I, I don't know how to do one, so maybe that will help me. And you can see, for example, in Google Trends, that clean architecture is, r is growing at a, a rate that you can't look at find on the other ones. Okay? The popularity is massive. So if everyone is going for clean architecture, it's our duty to understand it. It's our duty to talk about it. Even if we find that there are other tools or there are others that may be better for the problem that you have, you should talk about it and you should use it. So I tried to use it, but with the same results. And let me show you one small video that will demonstrate what usually happens when you do what I have done, where you go from architecture to architecture, pattern to pattern, just going with the hype, but without thinking about it, without stopping to really understand it. Okay, this is a perfect monolith, let's face it, right? Really beautiful. Now a junior developer will approach this to do a small refactoring. <laughs> okay, we know where this will go, right? She shouldn't do that. Yeah. You may have a lot of questions now. I get it. Why such a young person as a junior developer? <laughs> we need to start hiring really soon nowadays. It's difficult to hire. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to advocate for an NDC for kids. <laughs> um, question number two, why a developer dressed like Elsa from Frozen? <laughs> <laughs> this was shoot during the pandemic. Maybe you wore on a pyjama, so don't judge. Question number three, is she available for hiring? No, she is not, unless someone works for Disney, okay? On that <laughs> case, we can discuss it. By the way, this is Beatrice, my daughter. Can I have a round of applause for her? <laughs> As you can see, Beatrice knows a lot about software. And she is only six years old, so. And um, what she has showed us is what usually happens when we, we think we have uh, the proper and the best architecture until the moment that the, someone that doesn't know a lot about that tries to do something there. And either all the tests go red and that person shies away because she's afraid of doing that change and basically reverts, or the worst thing, the tests are really crappy and you don't get it and you will spot a problem in production. And this is the conclusion that I came up, that basically my conclusion is that and le let me tell you this, you are not a good software engineer, you are not a good software architect, if you pick an architecture and you don't think how it will be tested, okay? If you don't think about the cognitive load of taking a decision of what test to write, where to write them, and if you don't think about the friction of maintaining those tests. 
and it's our responsibility of thinking about that. Okay, so let's go to the to the framework that I promise you to address these kind of problems, and let's start by the architecture. First thing that is important to say is that if you sh if you tell me that you choose clean architecture and you really want to use it, I will assume three things. I will assume that you are using clean architecture because you value device independence. You value device independence. You value testing in isolation. And you value a strong domain logic. Okay? Otherwise, let me tell you one thing that's better than this. Okay? If you choose this one, please take a look on the main things that clean architecture is trying to solve in the world. Okay? And as I told you, there's a major flaw here in clean architecture. Can you see the, that uh, the onion architecture diagram? This one is the one from the original uh, blog post by Jeffrey Palermo. Don't look for the ones that you find on Google where someone used uh, PowerPoint to generate a random graphic with many colors. As you can see, Jeffrey chose only two colors, yellow for the inside and orange for the outside. Only two. Internal, external. That should be something that you are familiar with now after I've been talking about hexagonal architecture. Besides that, he adds a, a, a note saying that everything that is in yellow is the application core. I also know that, right? But you look into the clean architecture and don't find that. At least it's, it's not really clear. So everyone, when looks into this thing, they assume that they should have a given number of projects. So they go online, they find a, a template. Usually all the templates for clean architecture are always the, the same thing. The only thing that they, sh they do is changing the names that Robert C. Martin picked to a different thing. Okay? Instead of entities, they name it domain. Instead of use cases, they name it application, because it sounds better, let's face it. But if, when I look into this thing, I can see two things here, only two things. I can draw a box there and say that those two things are the internal application, right? What's the advantage of doing that? Once you do that, you can map this thing into a port and adapter diagram. And why do I want to do that? Because once I do that, will be pretty clear that you should have clear ports or contracts with the outside. And by doing that, all the mess that you are putting on a, a single bucket that named infrastructure become different adapters into your application. And you can bring one amazing rule from hexagonal architecture. One port, two adapters, okay? One single port should always have one adapter for testing and at least one that is a, an implementation, okay? To connect to external device. Once you start bringing that idea into here, you will see that tests become more natural, okay? So now many of you may be asking, okay, but how do I structure that in a solution? You can go with the, oh, sorry. I told you that I remember every single slide, but not the order where they are. Okay, so now that you know this, what I will redesign the, the, the diagram for clean architecture in the way that I think it makes more sense. So the application and the, and the domain, to me, they are the core of your application. On the book for clean architecture, Robert C. Martin says that when you have a domain, likely it will be used by different teams, for example, inside of your company. I've never seen that happening. Never. So taking the decision of making that domain public, it's up to you, okay? But the important part to me is that you consider this as a core. Then it says that you have interface adapters. I keep it. Let's just map it to the idea of driving. You may have adapters like a web application, an API, a CLI, a message handling, something that is reacting to the outside world. And you have driven adapters. And by the way, tests. Those, that <laughs> one is the most important one. God bless you. And the driven, you will find things like a database, tests, um, Kafka, 
you uh, message publisher, an SMTP sender, whatever, okay? Something that your application will call to have an impact on the outside world. So now that you know that, you may ask him, brother, that uh, how do I structure this thing? And you may be structuring with such a complex thing as this, where you pick a project for each one of those things. But let, it, let me tell you one thing. This doesn't matter at all. Doesn't matter. If you have a microservice that is just f fulfilling one single mission and you have four projects, maybe you should rethink some things, okay? But on the other side, if you have a really complex application and you are not using microservices, maybe having different projects is a good way to enforce the dependency rule. Because the most important thing about Clean Architecture, Onion, and Hexagonal is the dependency rule. What is the dependency rule? Is that adapters know the core and not the other way around. But you can do that with projects, we can do that with components, we can do that with layers, you can do that with folders, you can do that with files. It doesn't matter at all. What it matters is that you keep in mind of the dependency rule, you find your ways to control that dependency rule, and then you can implement the screaming architecture. To me, it's basically feature folders, but uh, Robert C. Martin thinks that screaming, it's a better name. What is the screaming architecture? If you look into, a f uh, for example, the folders, uh, a folder of your solution, and you see the names of the folders and the files, you should understand what that application does. When you look into, for example, an MVC application in .NET, often you have no clue of what that thing is doing because everything is inside of a controllers, controllers folder or a views folder, a models folder. Once you go in the feature folder approach, it becomes more clear. So regarding structure of code and things like that, keep those two things in mind. Doesn't matter the number of projects. And one thing that really matters is the approach that you have when you're structuring your code. Do something like this. But all that is just a different way of clean architecture, let's face it. If you don't think about tests, you will fail like I have done many times. Until the moment that you realize that you need to think about tests as, as if they were a different host of your logic, the, prob the probability of you failing is quite high because you will not give the value that tests deserve. Okay, you may refactor your code of your tests, you may say all those things, but if you don't think that you first deploy your logic into tests and then you deploy into production, you don't give him the respect that he, he deserves. And as I told you moments ago, in my opinion, we are not a good architect, a good engineer, if we don't think of this thing will be tested. And as I told you, clean architecture and the other ones that I've been talking about one of the main goals is testing in isolation. So let's see how we can approach this thing. We have seen the architecture part, and now let's see the testing part. Let's try to reconcile both. I'm keeping alien technology. Maybe one day if they come, I will be a developer advocate for the aliens. Let's see how it goes. And the idea is exactly the same. As far as you go up, tests will uh, take more time, the effort to write them is quite high, all those kind of things. One thing that is important is that I'm changing the names. Don't pay too much attention for now on those. And I'm changing the name of the pyramid. Why? It's important to say that the pyramid is not for every single type of test that you have. It's not for manual tests. It's not for those end-to-end -end tests that cover all the services of the application. It's for the automation tests that a developer should do when he is implementing a given application, a given service, okay? And with that in mind, let's start by the unit tests. Okay, unit. There's no good definition of what a unit test is, but I find that there's one really good of what a unit test is not, is the one from Michael Feathers. And what Michael tells us is that a unit test is not something that will touch a database, go across the network, depends on settings on your application, on your machine, depends on the outside world, okay? It's focused on the inside. 
on a pure thing. Doesn't that remember you about something? It remembers me about the core application, right? The same idea, no dependencies on the outside. So now you have your first rule of the framework of how to reconcile those thing, two things. Around your core application, you write unit tests. But even then, you can do something messy like this, where 90% of your code is just mocking. Can you read it on the, on the back? Yeah? I'm sad for it. You shouldn't <laughs> suffer like that. This kind of test usually is a huge problem. When, uh, for example, Beatrice was refactoring that monolith, if all the tests go red, it's because of this kind of tests. These kind of tests don't respect basic properties of the test desiderata. If you don't know what the test desiderata is, it's basically a set of properties that Kent Beck and Kelly Sutton come up <coughs> that describe what a good test is, okay? And basic properties like structuring sensitive or domain driven, uh, behavior driven is something that a test with so much mocks and so mo mo many mock verifications is not doing at all. It's not testing any single behavior there. Okay, so this is one huge problem. And what you can do to address those kind of problems? Usually we tend to write uh, solitary tests. And especially when you write tests after your code, I'm not saying that everyone should convert to TDD. I do it, but I'm not saying that. If you want to see a good talk about TDD, take a look then on YouTube, the one from Martin on Wednesday. But solitary testing is basically when you have your system under test, that purple box, and you mock every single dependency, okay? I'm not saying this is not valid. This is useful in many cases, but you have different approaches that you should bring as well, like sociable tests. Okay, sociable tests is the idea that when you are testing that thing, you use real implementations instead of mocks. You may mock one thing or two, like that uh, white box that I leave it there. That white box may be, for example, something that will make that test a test that is not a unit test, okay? Something that will break that uh, rule. So if that dependency is, for example, something that goes across the network, I should keep mocking them, okay? There's no problem with mocks, okay? There's sometimes I, I see a kind of a movement against mocks. You should use them carefully. You should not use them too much, but they are useful. Okay? Remember what happened to Alistair that couldn't have that loopback or a mock. So keep this in mind when you are writing your tests. Once you start writing sociable tests, you will see that you have a more black box approach to testing. Okay, and by doing that, you basically are writing your contract first. When you start doing that, you'll see other thing. That is, the number of times that you use the public access modifier will decrease. We use too many times the public access modifier. Is that an interfaces? Everything is an interface usually just because of testing. Let's face it, right? So. And why do you want to, to get to that place where you go away with many public things? Because the only things that should be public is your ports, your contracts with the outside world. You want to reduce the surface that can cause a dependency from the external world. Let me tell you one story. I used to work on a company where we delivered um, a service that was installed in our client's uh, servers. And on the package that was installed, there was a set of DLLs that we published, but it, they were only for that application to run. One day we decided to do um, a refactoring. Some things changed the name, some things we changed the access modifier, so many things. Until the day that we released that thing and the customer called us to complaining that it, his code isn't running anymore. And we asked, what code? No one should be depending on that thing. We don't have that thing documented. But let's face it, if you find a DLL there, it solved this problem, that thing was public, isn't that a contract now? That's basically the Edom's law. The Edom's law tells you that any kind of behavior that can be observed by the outside world will eventually become a contract. Example, when you buy something online 
and you are used that on that store, you always receive an email on the, the moment that you click uh, confirm the, the order. If you don't receive it in one hour, you will start thinking that something went wrong with that order, okay? Maybe they just put the, the mailing mechanism on a queue. We don't know. It was a simple refactoring for them. But for us as a customer, we create an expectation. So that became a kind of a contract for us. And the same way that I'm assuming that as a consumer, I can have an application that was developed observing a mailbox and expecting that thing to come, right? So we always need to think about what can be seen from the outside. So enough of unit tests, let's talk about integration tests. And this one is a funny one. Why it's a funny one? Let me just remember you one thing. We are talking about clean architecture. Clean architecture tell you that you value device independency. If you don't value that, don't use clean architecture, okay? If you value dependency, um, if you value this being agnostic of your dependencies of the delivery mechanisms, when you are writing your integration tests, I think you should not approach them in this way. For example, you have your tests, your tests call, for example, an API, your API will forward the request to the application and to the domain, then it will go to a database. Sometimes you will be using SQLite or something like that, and then the everything goes back and you assert the result, right? This is the most common thing that you see online for integration tests. Or for example, sometimes you see a kind of subcutaneous test where you don't want to use Selenium, so you don't go through the web, or you don't want to use Playwright or something like that, so you go on the layer uh, below. But let me ask you one thing. You value dependency, you will be agnostic of the dependencies that you have, so why don't you test against the port? Why you don't test, for example, that connection to the database against the real database? Instead of using SQLite, you can just make sure that that adapter fulfills the contract that you clearly specified what it should do, and you just uh, spin up a container. Now that is really cheap with things like test containers. And you assert that the thing is working. It gets the information that you want. It inserts information that you want. All those kind of things. Or on the other side, for example, why do you need to test all the logic, for example, if uh, you get the customer, if it returns, for example, 404 or not? Why don't you just call that API? You mock the response that you are expecting. For example, if it returns a null or a monad or something like that, you know that you should expect a 404, okay? You can just do that. And by doing that, you have a huge advantage. That is, you are now testing that device in isolation. You already have tested your application. So when you see something going red, you know where the problem is, okay? And let me tell you one thing. If you believe that by testing through the API, one day you will gain the advantage that when you bring a new adapter, like a web application, you already have the tests. No, you don't. You need to rewrite them because you can check the way of asserting that the customer exists is not the same using REST as it is using HTML. So I don't trust in tests that have been changed, right? So, and by the way, just one small note. Historically, integration tests were made when two teams were developing different components and there's a moment on the development flow where they came up together and then test the integration of those two components, okay? We usually do integration tests to test the integration of components that are developed by the same team. Have you thought about that? It's the same people implementing that application core and those adapters. So you may be asking, okay, but I have tested the core, I tested the adapters, but how can I be sure that I have the application well configured, dependency injection, all those kind of things. It's because of that that I say that you need application tests. What is an application test? It's an, a test that will spin up your application with every single adapter plugged in and will make sure that everything goes fine. But it's a kind of a smoke test because all the corner cases have been tested in the past, okay, on the other layers. So now what you do is simply you spin up that thing and likely you already have those tests. You have been doing end-to-end -end tests and functional tests and acceptance tests and whatever name you, you give them, but you, 
likely you already have them. You simply don't need as many more as, as you have nowadays. All those corner cases that you have been testing through functional tests are now tests on the other places. You are just making sure that everything works as a whole. Okay, you have your pyramid. You can map it to each layer of the clean architecture, but you need to keep that pyramid fit. Okay. And when I say that, it's not that general advice of you should refactor your code as you do with your real code and all those kind of, of things. I'm saying that keeping an eye that sh that uh, pyramid is still efficient, is still fulfilling its main job. Good example. Let's imagine that I will buy uh, an electric car, okay? I have uh, an insurance for that car, really good insurance, and you know, on the day after, I receive a different proposal with a, an insurance plan with the same coverage, same price, but now it covers one thing more, okay? So it has one more risk that is addressed. What I should do? Option A, subscribe the new insurance and cancel the, the old one. Option B, I subscribe new insurance and I keep both. Which one do you think? A, right? It's reasonable. But we as developers, we like to keep both. We like to start copying tests because we don't like the way that the other one was written and we are now asserting the same things. And once again, we are violating properties of the test desiderata because now we are not looking to test as, a, as composable, okay? Tests should work as a team, okay? You should not, you don't need many tests asserting exactly the same thing. And that is basically the sunk cost fallacy. We look into tests as a good thing, and they are. We know that you invest time in developing them, okay? But even then, if you are afraid of deleting that because you, in the past you invest time on that, you are committing a mistake because every single line of code being tests or not is a tax that you are paying in the future. So keep that in mind. Other thing that you can do to keep your pyramid in shape is uh, keeping optimizing that pyramid, okay? You keep an eye on it, and every time that you see a red light going on on the top layer, you always ask the question, can I cre write a test? If you don't find another red, red light, you ask. Can I write a test on the, the integration tests or in the unit tests that will give me the same result? If so, you write that test there, you see it's going red, you remove the one from the top, and you address that issue. Now you will keep that thing in shape, okay? It's more important to keep an eye on this than that idea that you, you always need to refactor and clean code and something like that. So we came up through all this journey for me to show you that if you look into clean architecture, and you don't think about how, how it will be tested, you have a problem. And if you apply the same ideas to test clean architecture that you do in other types of architecture that don't value device independency, <coughs> maybe you, are, mm, you shouldn't be using clean architecture. <coughs> and I promise that I will leave you with a simple framework. And the simple framework is basically this. You start, your your, you start coding a feature by your core application. You implement your unit tests around it. Keep in mind all those things of sociable, uh, less things in public, the contract, all those kind of things. Then when you are happy with it, when you have more information, you are confident, you move on to the next stage. I'm not saying that you need to implement all the application core. You can go by features, okay? But when you have information enough, now you can take the decision, you delay that decision of which adapter do I want to use. Is it SQL Server the best database for this thing? Should I be using Kafka? Should I be using Rabbit? All those kind of things, these decisions that you can delay once you have more information, okay? Now you implement your adapter, you test the contract, basically the port that connects to that adapter through integration tests, use Docker to test with real technologies when you can, is awesome. And then you move to the final step and you make sure that in fact you configure the R application well, okay? In fact, dependency injection is uh, correct, configurations are correct, all those kind of things. You, you do a smoke test for that, okay? It's basically this, okay? This is the most important slide that I have, okay? Just give me a moment for a picture. Okay. <laughs> so, 
In 2010, Steve Jobs published an, an open letter uh, with the name Thoughts on Flash. Everyone remembers Flash. Who doesn't remember Flash? Who is afraid for saying that doesn't remember Flash? Okay. We all suffered with it in the past, right? Uh, tech support for families was heavy on those days. And Steve Jobs, on this open letter, he describes why Flash w was being banned by the iOS ecosystem. And many people start complaining with that move. But nowadays, I think we will not find a single person that would stand for that position, because in fact it was a good thing for us. But the problem is that at the time on this open letter was not only a dead certificate for Flash, but also for other technologies. And if you have been on the Microsoft space for a long time, you remember that around this time, everything was Silverlight. Silverlight was awesome, was the best technology that we could have. It was the way that it was uh, sold to us. Anyone, anyone here was a Silverlight developer? Sorry, Matt. Let's just give a, a minute of silence for that. <laughs> uh, okay, so what happened at the time is that many companies were highly invested on Silverlight. They saw Microsoft saying that it was a good thing, they built a lot of products with it, and until the moment that this thing happened. And now they needed to go away to a different technology like HTML5. Many couldn't move to that. To many, it was too expensive to do that. Okay? Many of those products were a completely waste of effort and money. And what I believe is that us, as developers, as architects, as engineers, we have the responsibility to be ready for once one letter like this comes out again. So I hope that I give you the framework to simplify those decisions, to help your team to achieve that, and I hope that you like it. Thank you all.